Hi, everyone, and welcome to Creator Talks. I'm your host, Christopher Calloway. This week, I have a bonus for you. This is the audio from the interview I did with J.K. Woodward, the artist on Mirrors and Smoke, a one-shot through IDW coming this October. For this interview, I literally sat down with J.K. at his suite at the Rio Hotel and Casino the evening of Friday, August 2nd, during the Star Trek convention in Las Vegas. J.K., welcome to Creator Talks. Thanks for having me. Good to have you back, man. I'll start off with something. Uh, people say, Chris, why do you start with this stuff? Well, I'll, I'll get to it. You see this little, <laughs> little bumper here on my head? This little scratch? Yeah, yeah. I have three screens at work, and I lost connection. And I'm like, oh, well, I'll, I'll fix it. So I, I leaned over to fix it, and there was a metal shelf. Bam. <laughs> and I'm bleeding. And someone at work says, you're bleeding. I'm like, yeah. Have you ever done anything like that where you, know, you hope nobody sees it? And you're like, oh, my God. I oh, can't geez. believe... Where do I start? I just did that. <laughs> you pick, pick like one, one situation. <laughs> it, it happens a lot. I've, uh, I've, usually at cons, I bump into things, <laughs> knock things over. I can't think of a specific example better than San Diego this year. <laughs> what happened to San Diego? San Diego this year, uh, when I was going for a signing, I, uh, I just came around where IDW has this like big booth set yeah, up where yeah. they have the signing area yeah and i i didn't know it was how flimsy it was and i i went and leaned on it as i walked in and just knocked the whole thing down so yeah <laughs> i have a better story with harlan ellison oh do Har- tell. Do uh, tell. okay so uh star trek uh I, I think it was this con las vegas 2014 it was when we first announced we were doing city on the edge of forever yes and they had him as a guest and he was riding around in a rascal. It was like right after a stroke. So he was like in a rascal. Okay. And he backed up and knocked over the whole IDW. Booth. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And so Chris Rael contacted me the next day and he's like, I need to commission you to do a, a, a drawing of a, a, like a Big Daddy Roth version of Harlan Ellison. <laughs> you know, you're familiar with Big Daddy Roth, like the, the hot rod yeah, artist. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, yep. He wanted something like that with Harlan. Oh, like, my God. Nah. Oh, my God. <laughs> It happens. Yeah, it happens, happens to the best yeah. of us, yep. and even the worst of us, me. <laughs> uh, so we're here at the Star Trek convention in Las Vegas, and we're at the Rio right now. Today, you had an IDW panel? Yes. How did it go? Any, uh, any it was great. It was great. There's a lot of exciting things coming out. Um, a lot of what they announced is stuff that's already out. We were talking about the, um, uh, the Tiptons right now are doing uh, something called the Q Conflict. Yes. Which is for Marvel fans, if you remember the classic Marvel contest of champions back yes. in like '83, I think Way it back. was. Yes, it's basically doing that with Star Trek. So it's all the godlike beings are bringing all the the cast members together for the first time to fight each other. Because so it's a Q, uh, um, the Organians. Uh, what's what's uh, trend? Tri- tri- what's what's one you know better than I? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going around saying to people, Nanu, Nanu, and like, get out of here. What are you talking about? <laughs> Basically, all the godlike beings you've met in Star Trek are, are using um, these guys as pawns to fight each other okay. to, to settle a bet that they have. Ah. And it's, it's kind of petty, and it, it's very um, uh, pantheon Greek mythology. You know, the gods are petty, and they're using the mortals to entertain them. And it's a really great story. And what you get to see is Kirk in his prime from like season three with Cisco and you know, so it's, it's outside of time, okay. which makes it like much cool. more interesting. And the, uh, uh, next generation enterprise E crew, you know, so Voyager's there, everybody's there. It's, it's one of the most amazing things. Um, but what's happening is there, the, uh, issue six comes out, I think next Wednesday, okay. which is the final. And they're, uh, they announced today, October uh, 15th, they're going to have the collected um, oh, trade paperback. Very nice. Very year. nice. Um, binge. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and isn't there also, during the convention, a cruise preview? And I looked that up. Yeah. It's I, so loud. It's like a waiting list for this now in March of 2020. Yeah, yeah. Well, the March in 2020 is sold out. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there are people waiting for cancellations, hoping they'll they'll get in. That's right. Um, and it, it kind of made me wonder why are we doing this panel? Because I was on yeah, a panel it? for the cruise, <laughs> like we we're selling something that's sold out. Get on the wait list. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it was just nice to talk about because we, uh, I, I think a lot of the people that were there, 
were there were people that were going and wanted to hear what, yeah. what they could What's expect. Up. Yeah. And we had some good surprises. Um, we started with Robert Picardo, and then uh, John Delancey and uh, Wang came over um, because it's a very Voyager-centric yes. thing. Yes, it's the 25th anniversary. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Which lines up great with the, the book I'm doing. That's right. Which, uh, yeah, which was just announced at uh, San Diego. Or am I jumping the gun? We, no, no, no. We what? Were, yeah. well, 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 we'll go further into that. We can talk about it right now. This is okay. called Mirrors and Smoke. Now, the last time we spoke, that's almost rhymes. The last time we spoke, <laughs> you were working on uh, Broken Mirror and, or Mirror Broken. But it's, it, it hit me that, wait a minute, the words are flipped and how we usually norm, normally use them. Yeah, there was Just a, like the universe is flipped yeah. around. I was like, duh, <laughs> finally dawns on me, right? <laughs> But it was also because it was a, a episode uh, called Broken Mirror for uh, Deep Space Nine. Yeah. So we had to go mirror broken. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so this is going to be a one shot. Yes. Uh, tell me about your writer, who you're working with, and what we can expect in this one shot. So this is the rare occasion I'm not working with the Tipton brothers, which I normally, uh, mm -hmm. who I normally work with. Um, working with Paul Allure, who uh, has done. You probably know him from IDW, Ninja Turtles, yeah. G.I. Joe. Yeah. He's done a lot of work. This is his very first Star Trek book. And uh, it's a Mirror Universe book, which is a great place to start. Um, and uh, the script, um, it basically starts, we don't worry. Okay, so Mirror Universe, Voyager, is also in the Delta Quadrant. We don't talk about how they got there or why they're there. We just start off just in get the into middle it right of the away. story. Yeah, yeah. Right away, action scene. It opens like Star Wars with a with a, a space fight. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. so it's it's going to be very exciting. And uh, they refer to Janeway as the um, the pirate queen of the Delta Quadrant. So that should give you enough information. I, I can't say much more than that. Okay. But uh, that tells you the tone of the book and what they're doing while they're in the Delta. They're not worried about going home. Okay. As much as they're worried about, you know, let's let's conquest. Yeah, let's let's take it all. <laughs> now, how is it working with Paul versus the Tiptons? Because now you're working with a different writer, one writer. Is it any different for you, laying out, preparing, getting the book ready? A little bit. Um, with the Tiptons, we worked together so much we had a shorthand, yeah. and I had access to them. I would talk to them all the time while I'm working on something. Oh, this panel, can I do this instead? You know. Um, now I'm working with somebody I'd never worked with before, but um, but I like the way he, I, I feel like Paul wrote this book for a painter uh -huh. because there's a lot of three panel pages, splash pages, uh, a lot of, um, a lot where I can kind of spread out and do. Take full like, advantage of the medium. Exactly. Yeah. yeah like uh, he's, he's almost, um, I've recently worked with Jim Kruger for the first time, who wrote oh. for Alex Ross. Yes, yes. And, and he reminds me of him. He has all these, like, big panels. He knows who he's writing for. You know, he knows he's writing for a painter. So um, I think visually we're going to have some really good stuff in this. You know, and, and I've just only done the layouts so far. When, as soon as I go back Monday, I start the actual book. Okay. So we'll, we'll have some uh, things to look at soon, but... I, I, I want to predict that it's probably going to be some of the best art you've seen from me because I'll, I'll have the time, I'll have the space, yes. you know. Well, I, I know it takes time. I mean, you like to have four weeks to six weeks for a single issue when you're sure. working on a series. I know the last one you did, the um, Mirror Broken, it got extended. Like more issues were added, I believe, than what was initially planned. So for you, that was a lot of work. And at one point, you had to work in like a gray wash versus... Yeah, because just because of deadlines, it was just so well, hard it, to get it, that kind of work done. Yeah, it wasn't that uh, they planned more. It was just that the deadline changed for ah, whatever reason. Okay. So instead of six weeks, I had five weeks. They moved it on you. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I was like, I can't do a, a, a painted pain. comic in five weeks because the best I could do is three or four pages a week, and and you know, so we came up with the the idea of uh, doing ink wash, which looks very similar just black mm -hmm. and white mm -hmm. and we have somebody um really talented colorist that's done a lot of work with star trek charlie kirchhoff okay. yeah, yeah. um did the colorization of okay. my ink washes and uh it ended up it, it wasn't exact but it was enough where most people didn't notice yeah that it wasn't it jarring wasn't, or it didn't pull yeah. you out or anything like that yeah. no 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 yeah. yeah 
And yeah, it was. That's it was a great watch, which is so good. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's still like, he's still painting. It's it's great watch, but it's still it is. It, it really looks like yeah, the painted yeah. stuff just it black does. and white. It does. Yeah, with yeah. a little more contrast, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, but the difference was like uh, twenty hours for a painted page. This was like ten hours for these, so okay. it made a huge difference in in time. So. So you must feel more comfortable, more relaxed, being able to do a, a one-shot issue, which is going to be part of a, a series of, of this alternate universe books coming up with the sure. original Star Trek, Deep Space Nine. But this is the first one leading this off for IDW, and it's coming out in October. Yeah. Halloween special. How, yeah. Is it really? Are you yeah, guys yeah. shooting for Halloween? Yeah, yeah. Last week of October. There's a it's, treat for Halloween. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Um, but we're hoping for more. Um, I'm hoping this does really well because I would love to do um, what we did with uh, Mirror Broken yes. with TNG with Voyager. I would love to tell more stories. And this script actually ends on a nice little kind of open tag. Okay. So there's, so there's room won't. for, yeah. Won't leave yeah. you hanging. Yeah. But. And I so badly open. want to tell you what it is. I want to tell you what the last line is, but I won't. You tease. I don't want to ruin it. Yeah. But. Uh, when you read it, you're going to be like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear that story. And we're hoping that. We're hoping, like, when you get to the last page and, you, and, and Janeway says, you know, let's go where we're going. And when you hear what she's talking about, you're going to want to read more stories. And we were really hoping. I, I would love to do, like, another, like, a, like a five-issue miniseries like we did with uh, yes. Next Generation. That's, that's our, our hope and dream. So buy the book. So we can do that. <laughs> well, there's a very strong, Talking you passionate Star Trek fan base. Yeah. And being at the con here, have you heard a lot of feedback from Star Trek fans who maybe haven't seen your comics that are discovering those now and that are really pumped about it? Well, you know, I'm kind of a big deal, so most people know who I am. <laughs> so. <laughs> Hence the shades. <laughs> no, no, it, it happens all the time, um, and and I consider that a success. When somebody hasn't heard of Mirror Broken and they find out about it for me, then I'm doing my job. Yes, <laughs> yes. Because they're um, the thing is, I I work in a really kind of precarious place in comics. Comic people aren't really into Star Trek. Star Trek people aren't really into comics. comics. Yeah. So it's 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 it's. To me, the best thing that could happen is introducing somebody to something and getting them to read it. And things like this convention and the cruise and running into people like, oh, I never heard of that. You know, they'll see the, the cover and go, oh, my God, look, this uh, it's, Riker has huge arms. What's that all about? And then I get to tell them about yeah. it. And then you got their now we got a new reader, you know. And, uh, and my, my hope, my dream is to get readership of the Star Trek comics up because some of the best stories being told are in the comics. Yes. And in the novels, yes. you know, and uh, if, if you're just watching the show, you're missing out on a lot of really good stories. So listen to this guy. You've got the buying funnel down. You've got their attention. You've got their interest. Yeah. And now <laughs> time to make a decision. And action. Purchase. <laughs> <laughs> Buy it. <laughs> well, you have some passions in your life, three in particular that we both share in common. Let's talk about some of them. Star Trek. And you actually, yes. you actually kind of alluded to something I want to get to later about introducing someone to something they haven't heard of before. Mm -hmm. But which is better, Star Wars or Star Trek? No, I'm just kidding. That's a, that's a horrible question to that's ask. That's not here. even a hard <laughs> question. <laughs> we but, know the answer. But, but let's, let's put a little spin on this. What do you think will be remembered a thousand years from now, favorably, and, and why? Like, what do you think? I mean, I have my, my prognostication, which will stand out more at that. That's a long time, you know, generations and generations from now. Yeah. What do you think? You mean in... With it's just in, it's in culture. Properties in general? Yeah, yeah, just in uh, culture. Well, I'm afraid it's going to be the Marvel movies, but... <laughs> <laughs> not that I don't love them. I love the Marvel nice, movies, but, they're I, you know, they're, they're, they're popcorn. They're fun. Yes. Um, I, I'm kind of hoping it's Star Trek, because Star Trek has... Um, in the test of time, they've lasted. Yes. I mean, we're, we're over 50 years in. Um, and if you watch Star Trek, um, the original series, it's a very different feel than, say, Voyager or, say, Discovery. And that's because Star Trek reflects the time we live in. Good point. So when people say things like, Star Trek, it's getting too dark. Well, I think you need to be worried 
because that means the world is dark. Yes. I mean, because we're reflecting we're, we're, the current we're reflecting, culture. Yeah, we're yeah. reflecting the conflict that we're ex we we exist in. Um, and I think for that reason alone, um, Star Trek is almost a history book. And I think w the same way we look back on the the uh, original series and learn about the '60s and get a flavor for what their concerns were at that time, we're going to have the same thing with Discovery or whatever's next. You know, Picard or you know. Or whatever's twenty years down the road, who knows? But I, I, I feel like Star Trek is um, is is the the monitor for what we're going through at the time. It's the reflection. It's the the mirror, if yes. you will, not to ah, pardon the pun. Very yeah, see good. what I did there? Well <laughs> done, sir. Well done. The other thing too is that Star Trek has prognosticated what is coming down the pike. I mean. You Flip look, phones. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Flip phones, yeah. the technology, and there it is. I mean, some of those yeah. things that wound up in the Apollo missions, and bam, there you are. It's, yeah. it's, it's become reality. And I think they'll look back on that in history and say, it all started here with an idea. Yeah. Just, just fantasy. That silly fantasy in sci-fi. What is it good for? Well, it brought us to this point where it is sure. now reality. And Star Trek in, in science fiction um, compared to, like, say, something like Star Wars is unique in that it is us. Like you can be here. on the Enterprise and see a no smoking sign or an exit sign, <laughs> That's or right. you know, it's us. It's not a galaxy yeah. far, far away. It's not. Um, it's where we think we're going to be, based on and in Roddenberry's dream, like came from the the moonshot at the time. But um, there's so much more um, happening in Star Trek, and I I, I think um, that what makes it unique as a sci-fi. Um, property not to take anything away from star wars i don't want people like no i love I, star wars I do. oh my god it's, it's don't a different thing please a different send thing. your letters to him <laughs> <laughs> now when you look at the various star trek seasons universes i should say universes but 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 series yeah each one what makes each one unique they have a common thread there's hope for the future right but what is it about each one that makes it special not necessarily the actors but something about the themes involved in this in each of those series well, you want me to go through all of them you can you can <laughs> paint so it with a, you can paint it with a broad <laughs> brush and say well, well overall enterprise i feel is really underrated okay and right. um what i really enjoyed about that is it was very it was like i was saying star trek is us and enterprise was more so because it was it was it felt very nasa like they were, yeah. they were really going out there for the first time. And I remember the the first episode that made me fall in love with the show was when they landed on a planet, and 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 uh, Scott Bakula's character was like, "All right, guys, take a minute. We're on a different fucking planet." You know, <laughs> wow. You know, and, it, 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 and soak you, it in. Think yeah, about and, it. And you felt that with them. You yeah. know, and, and it, to me, that was like very exciting. So I think that's what Enterprise is. Um, uh, the original series was uh, very subversive, and and like like '60s was um, almost kind of like the time we're living in now. It was it was very divided. Yes. There was a lot of conflict, and they dealt with that. And they were um, they were what we would call uh, progressive or liberal now. Mm -hmm. um, the shows, and they took a lot of chances, and and it cost them a lot. Um, but when you watch that, you, you, you get a snapshot of that time in history, and I think that's what I really enjoy about that. Uh, Next Generation, um, same thing, but it was, like, it was almost like Star Trek got their shit together. You know what I mean? Because uh -huh. uh -huh. <laughs> it was definitely, a, a, like, they, they were definitely had, you know, it, it was a lot less conflict. They had figured things out, and they ran a much tighter ship, and I enjoyed that. Um, but they were dealing, again, with the issues in the 90s. Um, they were dancing around um, gay rights. They didn't want to come out and say it, but they did do that episode about the, um, um, the species that didn't have gender. No. And they said some of us identify as female and some of us identify as male. And what they were talking about were people that were born in a certain body but didn't feel like they were part of that body and here we are today yeah it's very much the and, then, yeah. and then now finally in star trek i i will one criticism is they took a long time to actually come out and um uh, and address that issue but they finally did in discovery we have gay characters now and uh and i think discovery um is probably the most progressive and ironically the most dark 
because they have so much to uh, deal with. And we are living in dark times. We are, it's almost like a, the original series. We're dealing with a divided country. We're dealing with a divided culture. And they kind of express that. So um, I think um, Discovery is also underrated for that reason. I think they made some broad, big steps that, uh, that should be applauded that um, probably isn't. Well, they, they made some big steps in the original Star Trek series. But, and I understand sure. that George Takai wanted to do more with making his character come out as gay. But, yeah. but Rod Miller was like, no, we can't push it that far right now. But they kept yeah. pushing the they boundaries. Pushed, they pushed as far as our interracial kiss, which was a brave yes. move, and yes. it lost the Mississippi, you know, for that. It, it <laughs> right? Did. They, right. They, Isn't they that amazing play. to yeah. hear that now? Yeah. 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 But it, it is, but it isn't, because um, there are people that are upset about a gay character on Star Trek, too. Mm -hmm. So, like, we haven't, sadly, we haven't progressed as far as we think. We're not there yet. But, yeah. No. But, but we are, uh, Star Trek is still pushing boundaries and saying, listen to this, look at this. And that's kind of important to me, and that's why I love Star Trek. That's I think, why I want to work in Star Trek. I think because of their sci-fi pushing boundaries, other sci-fi is also now willing yeah. to try to push well, boundaries. Well, sci-fi in general always pushes always, boundaries. Yes. A good sci-fi does, you know. And, and it's always an allegory. It's always an allegory for something. That's why it, people yeah. gravitate towards it. Yeah, yeah. It's a safe place. One of the first sci-fi movies I saw was um, Enemy Mine, and that was like, that was a yes. Cold War analogy, and it was also a, 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 a cultural analogy. Like, don't don't assume things about people because you you see these two people trapped on a planet together. They had thought they knew who the other one was, and they learned about each other. And then you know, oh God, couldn't we all yeah. do that? Wouldn't yeah. that be nice? Yeah, we'll learn more about each other rather than talking past each other. Yeah. <laughs> now you alluded to something, uh, and I want to kind of come back to that. If someone, and this is my hypothetical question, someone says, "Look, I I'm not a Trekkie. I'm not into Star Trek." I, I just don't want to watch it. What would you suggest to them to watch of any of the seasons, of any of the series, to draw them in? Like, for example... Inner Light. Inner Light. Inner Light. Okay. I Inner think, uh, I, I, I think um, most of the people that didn't like Star Trek, I showed them that show. Okay. And uh, it, there's so much humanity in that show and uh, in that particular episode. And uh, it's a high concept thing. He lives a life in 15 minutes. That kind of blows your mind. And most of the people I show that to end up liking Star Trek because of it. Um, and the great thing about that show is you don't have to know anything about Star Trek. Okay. Because the show is kind of outside yes. canon. And so, so if I was going to tell somebody, if you want to be your first Star Trek, watch that. You know. Very good, very good, good suggestion. Because I, a friend of mine, it's like, have you ever seen Star Wars? And he's like, my age. It's like, no. I'm like, how? How can you not yeah, ever, seen, ever, that, ever, yeah. ever? You gotta fix Star that. Wars, and, really? Of all things, right? I mean, I some people, it's, oh, I, I can't get into Star Trek because it's like, there's so much out there. But you very neatly summed it up with watch that one. Yeah. You don't have to know anything. You else. You don't have to know anything. And then you're hooked. Yeah. You're yeah. in. Yeah. You're in. Something else that's a big passion of yours, Doctor Who. Oh yes, yeah. And, and I used to, uh, when I was a kid, um, PBS used to play Doctor Who. Oh, I remember. And yes. I used to watch the Fourth Doctor was my first Doctor, always be my favorite. Um, second favorite is uh, Eccleston. I felt like he should have had like ten more he needed, seasons. He needed more, yeah, yeah. definitely, because oh, he had the cool leather jacket. That's right. Very, <laughs> very understated Doctor. I still have a few videotapes of Doctor Who. Um, I had to get rid of a lot of stuff when I moved to Vegas, so sadly I had to get rid of my videotapes. I actually taped Doctor Who off of PBS before there was DVDs available to buy. Right. But I still have the VHS tape that was produced uh, for, for sale with Tom Baker as the host reviewing his episodes. Oh, awesome. Have you ever seen that? No. They did the, like, awesome, the Tom Baker years, the William Hartnell years, the Patrick Troughton years, and I kept all of those tapes. Because they would have one of the doctors, if they were still around, like John Pertry did his years, Tom yeah, Baker sure. did his. But I think it was like, they even had like, uh, I think John Pertry might have done Patrick Troughton, so it might have been uh, a Peter Davidson. But, they, but I kept all those yeah. because even though they're like just showing you episodes you've already seen, you've got those interstitial uh, explanations yeah, by yeah. the doctor, which is like a nice little yeah. time capsule. So uh, I've kept those. Mm -hmm. But uh, who is... Your favorite doctor and why? I mean, I, obviously Chris Eccleston and Tom Baker. Tom Baker will always be my favorite because he was my first. first. You never forget it's your hard. first. Yes. 
<laughs> um, and yeah, it, it, like he captured my imagination when I was seven years old, and you never quite watch sci-fi the way you did when you yeah. were a kid. You know, like it's never as good as it was when you were a kid. Right. Um, I think, though, um, I liked Eccleston first because they were bringing Doctor Who back to America at that point. Yes. Like it was on the Sci-Fi Channel before uh, right. BBC America. That's right. And uh, so it was like th this revival that was kind of very exciting. We had gone without Doctor Who for quite some time. Um, but he also, um, he had a lot of this hidden pain, but he almost... He reminded me of Robin Williams in a way. He was like almost like manic oh. depressive, you know, like he was, he would have these moments where you could tell there was something deep, something hurtful, and then he would smile. Yes. And I was, I, I found something really, um, uh, I kind of attracted to that. Like a guy that could, um, he was almost like a, a, a veteran with uh, PTSD. And we find out later that's true with the war doctor and all yes. that stuff. Oh, um, awesome. But but he, he you can tell even through Eccleston's performance that there was something under there. But he was like, I'm not going to burden you with that, you know. And I I, I, I um, admire that kind of strength, and that's probably why. And the leather jacket, he yes. had the cool leather jacket. His so, season was so strong. Like yeah. all the episodes were so good. My favorite is one you go back to World War II. With the gas mask, mummy, Are you my mummy, Are you my... yeah. Oh, oh my god, god. It's so creepy. You gotta, oh, if you haven't seen that, it's you creepy, but I see. fucking tear up every time I watch it. Yeah, it's just heartbreaking. And yeah. then the doctor, and that speech he gives at the end, where yes. like today, no one else dies. I was like, oh, that was the first time could, they did you, that in the yeah. Doctor Who. Were yeah, today and you could don't... feel it. You could feel yeah. it in his performance that yeah. he's seen enough death. He's done with this, you know. Yeah. He, and he was like angry, but he was also like, you know. I'm going to save these children. I'm a little good. <laughs> <laughs> Have you gone back and watched all of them? Like from the first Doctor all the way through? Like binge watch? No. Oh, I mean, no. not all one yeah. shot. I mean, I would do no, it. No, but no, I, like okay. in order? Yeah. No, yeah. no I've, never, <laughs> I've never done that. I want to, but who has the time? <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> that is 50 years worth of TV. Well, here's a And point. unlike Star Trek, it's 50 years of TV nonstop, yes, pretty much. That's yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, pretty much. There wasn't like, any breaks in between, not, or not much. Well, they, yeah. they after the... Um, Eighth, right? Yeah. yeah. They had the, that horrible movie. It was the seventh. <laughs> yeah. And then they had the movie. They had the movie. Which, you know, yeah. uh, Paul McGann, I really liked him as a doctor. I love him I, as a doctor. The story, it was yeah. too, I don't know, American or something. There was just something... Yeah, that was, it wasn't well, right. that's what it was. I think uh, uh, it wasn't just BBC. It was um, BBC, BBC Fox. And, and Yeah. It yeah. just, it didn't have the same tone. Yeah, they're like, good. this needs to play in Peoria. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> and I, I feel like that ruined it, you know? Yeah. But again, if you were to pick one episode, if someone says, I'm not into Doctor Who, I don't... What Ooh. would be the one that say, hey, this is a good one to get in and watch the show? Blink. Oh! Blink. Per excellent yeah. choice. Yeah. Excellent choice. Definitely Blink. Because the Doctor's yeah. hardly in that one at all. He's in it like the yeah. very end. But there was another one. Oh, what was the other one where, where um, uh, they would... The Doctor was barely in that one, too. The, I would say that one. The, the, they would get together, and they would they would sing, and it was... Uh, ELO. Uh, ELO. It yeah, was like gods yeah. and monsters or monsters and aliens or something yeah. like that. Yeah. That, and I, it was, it right was a there. point of view from the people that the Doctor's... Doctor... Because you see yeah. the Doctor in every episode. He's touching people's lives, and you're like, what what happened to them? Well, this was an episode about the peripheral characters. That's right. So anything can happen. Yeah. yeah like yeah. anyone can die. Anything can change. You don't you don't know. You don't know. And it was oh. it was just such a, a, a again it was really humanity. It was such a beautiful episode. Um, I I wanted to hang out with these guys. I wanted to get together every Tuesday night and sing ELO with them. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, Those yeah. are two very good choices. Those yeah. are the ones that came to my mind. Okay. Like the so like, you're gonna let me get away with two choices? Yeah. Okay. I was. I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think you'll ever get a shot? At doing Doctor Who again, maybe with like through Titan. Well, like, do you want to get back in there and? I wouldn't mind. Do some who? Um, I did. I didn't pursue it because after uh, IDW lost the license, I was like, I'm going to stay with them with Trek. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was more of a loyal dog kind sure. of thing. Um, but I'm not against it. I just never pursued it because if if I have a choice between Doctor Who and Star Trek, I'm going to go Star Trek. Of course. Trek. Yeah. 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 Of course. Every time. Uh, but Doctor Who's really close, you yeah. know. And I, oh, that crossover was a, oh, I, oh, you man. know, for the first time in my life, I finally had everything I ever wanted. <laughs> that was a you great know? crossover. Yeah. I like mean, you. Did you get the, the Tom? I, I, I had Tom Baker references throughout the whole. Yes, night. it yeah. was. A, it was a great series. Oh my yeah. god! Yeah, I, I was so excited about that, and yeah, I, I love it. I love it. Absolutely great. Another passion of yours, and mine, David Bowie. Of mm -hmm. course. Uh, did you know? 
maybe you've seen this. There's a comic book coming out. I don't know when yet. Oh, don't tell me there's a Bowie comic I'm not drawing. Uh, Mike Allred? Oh, and Laura? that's okay. I love Mike Allred. Did you know so, about this? No. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. I saw this. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I saw this on social media. They posted it. It's, uh, I believe it's uh, Steve Horton is writing it. If I said that right, I'm sorry if I did not. Uh, Mike's working on it. Laura's working on it. And they're going to cover, it's called Bowie, Stardust, Rayguns, and Moon Age Daydreams through Inside Comics. It's going to cover 1967 through 1974. Okay. And I, after this, I'll show That's you. That's the year everybody loves. That's the uh, Bowie everybody thinks about. Yeah. After that this, and the 80s Bowie. Yeah. Absolutely. After this interview, I'll show you some art from it. I, oh, my God. Uh, yes. you, you, no, I mean, it's the all rights. I mean, it's like they. they interview they, over. They, <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to talk about somebody else's work, but I know that you would love no, to see I, this. No, well, first off, I'm a big Mike Allred fan. Um, well, yeah. I, I've, I've loved his work from the very beginning. And uh, his latest thing. Um, uh, a uh, friend of mine, Chris Robeson, wrote iZombie, and he did yes. the art for that. It yes. was just brilliant. He's brilliant. He does so much with so little. You know, the, that, that economy of line yes. you always hear about. Like, yes. he just does. It's, it's the opposite of what I do. You know, I do, like, this kind of photorealistic painting, and I'm always amazed with other artists that do things that I'm unable to do. And Mike Allred is, is a, a good example of that. It's just, he can say so much with one line, you know, when... But, but you know, cartoony, but it but it looks more visceral than than yes. what I can do with no, well, with paint. I, I mean, love both. Like, I mean, for different yeah. reasons, but I love both forms of art. Yeah. I, that's that's a show that the iZombie that my wife even got into, and we're watching the credits. I said, "That's that's Michael Albert's art." She goes, "Who's yeah. that?" I said, "Well, he, you know, did the work. yeah, on the show, <laughs> on the show, put it on the on show." The show. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so that'll be something to look forward to. Yeah. Uh, Jeez, a boy with Mike Allred. Oh, yeah. Shit. Oh, you're gonna, you won't believe this. It's incredible. Oh, you just, you, this is all I'm gonna be thinking about all night now. <laughs> <laughs> like oh my god! Now we talked about Aladdin of... Sane, drawn oh, by yeah. Mike Allred. Yes. <laughs> now we talked about some of Bowie's music last time, sure. and some of the. Did you get a chance to listen to his Lodger remix? Yes. Okay. What did you yes. think? Enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Enjoyed too. it. Yeah. It was. A, it was. Like I a still new like the experience. original better. I still like okay. the original better. All right. But uh, but and Lodger's like one of my favorite albums. Me too. So it's the most absolutely. underrated album. I, I yeah. absolutely agree. I, yeah. I mean, it's just it's timeless. Just, timeless. I, mean, I remember when I first got the album vinyl put it <laughs> yep. put it down me too just vinyl put down the first song and it's like <laughs> in the event of that first song just like that first beat at the first i was like i i love this album i love this album. it's a great album <laughs> yeah it's, it's still I, again it's like timeless stuff it just stands up over time yeah yeah uh now if you were to look through bowie's catalog and he did a lot of live tours course and everyone was a little different every performance the way he would do his songs even like two different legs of the tour he might even change up how he arranges sure. things is there something out there that you want to hear remixed remastered actually officially released on cd whatever high definition digital whatever <laughs> i still like yeah. the cds <laughs> i mean because they put out a lot lately you yeah, know, yeah. since his passing and even before he passed they, they put out like the diamond dogs tour a different version of that different leg of the tour different sound to it is there some tour that you outside. Want? outside yeah, outside tour, yeah first off underrated album yes brilliant album and and like nobody knows about that album but the songs on that album were in every movie in the late 90s the lost highway um i'm i'm sure there are other examples i can't think of right now but i mean it was it, it was it was in inundated in everything yet it was probably the most um, forgot about album. Yeah, and it was it was him and Brian Eno just doing him and Brian o, Brian Eno shit. I mean, it was just brilliant. And I get frustrated just talking about it. Like, why are people not you know like raving about this album? But it's the forgotten Bowie album. So I would love to hear. Yeah, any any anything of you know, Have you ever heard that live? Any of it live in a, a concert? No. No, I missed that tour. Well, yeah. after after, I came, after I, this, I'll send you a link later. Yeah, I was <laughs> I was in Germany at the time. So I understand when 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 that tour started. So yeah, I missed that. It was like right at the end of the twentieth uh, century. Yeah. So uh, a former guest of mine, I believe, saw him in uh, Amsterdam don't and sent me a link me to the whole concert. Oh no! Don't tell me that. <laughs> did, but I, I don't want to hear other people having fun. Did you get the one I mentioned on the last show with Nine Inch Nails? Uh, the, the CD. 
Oh yes. Yeah. Well, no, I we, we got it on vinyl because we're oh, vinyl snobs. Okay. But yeah, we oh. just recently got it. Um, oh good. Uh, yeah, I, I got it for uh, I got it for my wife because I the way I found out about it was I went to our Amazon account and I was about to buy some art supplies or something and then I saw this record there you and might I'm like. like. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. She had oh. already had it in her wish list. Oh. She just hadn't bought it yet. And I'm like, fucking well, push the button. Let me this. get you a gift here. Yeah. It was a gift for her. It was a gift well, I'll tell her. you what. Teenage Wildlife on that. The final oh. track. What an amazing. That's from 1980. Right? Scary Monster Super Creep. It's already a fucking great song. It's a great song to begin oh, with. I have to swear on this? Yes. Okay. I will. Hell of a time I got to check my reputation. <laughs> <laughs> I have the reputation. <laughs> but it, be that as it may. Yes, you may. <laughs> No, I'm not going to edit. <laughs> Teenage Wildlife is yeah, already a, it, a, it, it, it's, it's just brilliant, fantastic. phenomenal. Yeah, but phenomenal. that version, yeah, oh, it is, and they yeah. just close the show that way. And it just kind of fades out with each yeah. like each player in the band kind of leaving the stage just, yep. just, till it's drum beat at the very so, end. So amazing. Have you ever seen any of the um, the Bowie shows, the tribute shows after he died? You know, because I, I I have I. I I saw a local one, but it wasn't like people that were connected with this band. But I did see a local one in Wilmington. But please tell me about the one you saw. Um, so it's just basically everybody that's ever worked with him okay. and people that just like Bowie that would come out for sets. So you had different musicians every time. Um, but uh, just it, it, I saw it two years in a row, and it was it brought tears to your eyes. And they they had uh, like a lot of his backup singers. They're totally underrated, and I, I wish I remember their names right now, but I, I could look it up. <laughs> no, it's okay. But they, um, I, I get you. you know, they yeah. they were they were finally in the front, and they uh, were singing, and their voices yeah. were so operatic and beautiful, and they were singing things like um, stuff off of Low, which is like oh. well suited for that. And yeah. I just like I had to walk out of the room. I had to walk out of the room. It's it was like a very oh, emotional experience. <laughs> but yeah, really brilliant. And uh, uh, um, what, what's the, what's the guitar player I'm thinking of? I hate it when I forget names. Um, uh, Robert Earl Slick. Slick. Oh, Earl, Earl Slick. Slick. Yeah, he was on the they, 1974 they, Diamond Dog yeah, Store, right? Yeah. right? Yeah. Earl Slick was there, and he would not leave the stage. He was like, just going nuts. And he played this solo that went on at the, at the last song for like like 10 minutes. He just would not walk off stage. And I was like, this? Oh, my God, I'm in heaven. You if, know what I The would... only thing that would have made it better if yeah. Bowie was there. Uh, yeah. You know, which is, then I get sad. You know what I would love to hear, like released, and I've seen a little bit of the video, is when he was in Germany and he did a live performance on like a small I mean, bar or something, but he no. was there with his band that was playing with him at the time, Cutting Heroes. It was like yes. everything up through here. It was like right before stage, he was still over in Germany. Yeah. And I would, I would love to get that, but yeah. it's just not available what right now. What did you think about the next day? That I, was like his. I, that was like years later. Him saying, I "This is the really, album I would have done afterwards." I really liked it. I oh really my god, I love it. Valentine's was... Day gives me chills. If you don't know, next day, go out and buy that record. Listen to Valentine's Day. It's about this. This. It's from the point of view of the the character in the song, and it's about this guy that just flips out and shoots up a school, and it's just creepy as hell. But you don't you don't notice at first, and when you start list as the song goes on, and you're like, "Oh my god, this is dark." But they play it like uh, a... Yeah, like it, doesn't they play sound, it, it doesn't sound dark. No, I mean, it doesn't. Music. It's, it's like... Da, 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 right. da, it's very... Da, da. You know, it's like... It's, it's, they play it like they're a uh, high school rock and roll band. Like all sloppy. They purposely played it to sound like they were just a high school band. And it just... It's brilliant. It's brilliant. And it really gets that across. Like, it sounds like a... It sounds like a teenager. You know, a teenage band playing. And it's Bowie, the, the most experienced musician in the world. Playing like he's... You know... With yeah. the best musicians in the world playing like they're the worst musicians, and it was it's, it was a brave move. Yes. You know, it's it's hard to put your ego in the back seat, and he could do that. Yeah, yeah. you know, like yeah. Tin Machine, he was in the back seat. Oh with, my god, uh, those I love those two albums. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. the Sales Brothers. Yep, those guys yep. can play. Yeah, those guys can play. Yeah. And uh, you know, doing uh, the idiot and uh, producing yep. all that, and just being in the background playing piano. Yep, you know, I yep. mean. He didn't have that big. He even did that in the seventies when he was at the the height of his game. He was like writing for Mata Hoopal yep. and yep. You know, yep. all the young dudes. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Missed, but uh, he his legacy lives on, and uh, yep. the guy was a genius. And uh, if you're not into it, my hey, guy, I even got the I got, I got the shoes. You've got the shoes. I got the Vans. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Get that on camera. <laughs> Just Bowie. Nice. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> Well, this is the segment we call Kicking Back with the Creator, like I haven't been doing that. (laughs) 
and I asked her some questions last time, you know, like what you do for rest and relaxation, your cardio workout, of course, and you know, little alcohol What's drinking. rest and relaxation? <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm an artist. I'm working uh, all the time. <laughs> you seem to be having a good time. Oh, yeah. Well, hit now. Now. <laughs> now. But I have other questions I ask all my guests that I haven't had a chance to ask you, and these are a lot of fun questions to learn a little bit more about you, to think back on your life. And for my first question, what was your favorite birthday and why? Oh, Jesus. Okay, I know this. I, I, I got this right away. Hard. I thought that was going to be a hard question, but I could. Okay, so I, I, when, I, um, when I, I left, I ran away from home when I was 16. I moved to Hollywood, which is where they, so All right. there was this job I had um, doing, um, I was from New England, so I, it was a very manufacturing base, so I got used to always having a job. There was always like a, a, a factory job you could get with great benefits. I moved to California. It's a different culture altogether. Yeah. And so I, I, you'd either work in retail or um, telemarketing. So I got a job in telemarketing. That's a tough job. Yeah. Well, yeah, we had to cold call people and, and do movie surveys. Have you seen movies? What do you think of this movie? What do you think of that movie? And they don't want to talk to you. No. You got but, thick skin. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> it's like, bam. Get yeah. used to rejection. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I started doing those cold calls and I got into a, 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 a department called Movie View. And Movie View was if you're ever in Los Angeles area and you're a tourist and you get these little passes to go to see a movie before it comes out for market research purposes. Ah, okay. So you get to see a free movie before it comes out and then they ask you, they give you like a, a survey at the end of it. And they may tweak so, it afterwards too, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Based on the, Your you know, based on what they, yeah. So my job was to answer phone calls for people. When you get those passes, you have to call to confirm so we can make sure we have a, a, a good demographic. Okay. Because we want to keep a balanced demographic so we don't want like all white people or all black people. Right. We want a good sample of the yeah, population. Yeah, so yeah. And different ages and all this stuff. So mm -hmm. you'd have to confirm. And so I had that job doing that. And it was like a cushy job and I loved it. One day on my birthday, because it was such a cushy job, we got away with, we, we would smoke in there. We weren't supposed to smoke. We broke all the rules. So my birthday one day, we were like, okay, this is what we're going to do for his birthday. You're going to take your lunch break now at nine. <laughs> and everybody's going to take their lunch break with you. And everybody takes their hour lunch with you downstairs at the bar. It's a place called Thai Ice. We used to go to. And, and everybody goes down there and buys you a pitcher. You stay there. And then when, the sh when their shift is over, they go back up. And then somebody else comes down. So I, I got paid for eight hours of drinking. Nice. Yeah. And, 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 and like, if you can come up with a better birthday than that. <laughs> And I didn't have to hang out with the same person. Like, if I got sick of them, I just wait an hour. Somebody yeah. else is coming. <laughs> It'll change. But, I mean, w can you think of a better birthday than that's, that? That's yeah. amazing. I'm, a, I'm amazed you can remember it. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't remember all of it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe remember this. When you were a teenager, 12, 14, somewhere in there, what pictures or posters did you have on your bedroom wall? Oh, well, that's an embarrassing question. Oh, I think <laughs> I think a, a quiet riot, metal health. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, definitely, I had a Bowie poster, and I had uh, uh, Jack Kirby, Fantastic Four. I think uh, those are the three that I remember that I would look at all the time. Very yeah. good. So, uh, yeah, I was a bit of a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> well, no shame in that, especially yeah. these days. Well, no, there was definitely shame in that like Quiet Riot poster. I just I can't believe I said that. <laughs> People love it. You still. can edit that out. right? People love it still. <laughs> they look back and laugh. Yeah, mental health will drive you mad. It will. <laughs> now, thinking about technology, we talked about how you're not the most technical person, which is interesting because I I heard even like William Shatner doesn't even. Well, use it's a funny. Computer. I got a degree in computer science, and I can't open my door. So you saw that. <laughs> no, you did open your door. <laughs> I did. You, I did. You. I'm not bragging, I'm just door. saying I figured out how to open my hotel door. Yeah. But you, you don't feel that you're the most tech-savvy person. I'm really not. But is no. there some technology that we no longer use? It's kind of passe. It's, it's had its day. But you miss it. You still like it. Now, vinyl, of course, would be one. I yeah, would say right I, off the you bat. You took my answer. That's a, that. you, and, and why? why? I hear people tell me reasons why. Yours is probably the same, but I'm just curious. Why you still say vinyl and record players? It's Well, first off... The, the popular answer is it's a richer sound. Analog is a richer sound than digital, and you get uh, more out of it. Can you tell, um, though? 
I think I can. Okay. But it might be I might be imagining things. I don't know. Yeah. What did, I'm going to give you the real answer. The real. The answer. real answer is I love that little crackle. It just it, it it's a nostalgia thing, you know. I mean, I I, I my first memory was. Uh, Geez, I was like two years old, and I know you're not supposed to remember things, but I remember waking up in my crib and hearing, and then, dun, 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 dun. whole lot of love, Led Zeppelin too. Really? Yeah, you my dad that? loved that album. Yeah, I remember hearing that, and I was like, I think that's where I fell in love with rock and roll nice. was because of Led Zeppelin. Yeah, I mean, geez, get them while they're young, right? Yeah. Speaking <laughs> of music, what was your first concert you went to? Okay. Oh, is it embarrassing? Is no, it... It, well, it's technically the first concert I went to. It's because I work there. I, I didn't go to concerts when I was young. I, I didn't go to concerts until I was 16. Okay. And one of the first jobs I had was at a place called Great Woods, and it was a concert hall. And it was Julian Lennon, and I'm a huge John no Lennon kidding. fan. Yeah, really? No kidding, really? And I, you know, I'm, I'm not embarrassed about that because no, I'm a huge be. John Lennon fan. Yeah, and, yeah. And uh, I, I love John Lennon, so, you know, but I... Technically, I was being paid to be there. I was I was a guy with a little broom <laughs> sweeping up cigarette butts. I was that guy. <laughs> but that was my first concert, I, and I loved it. And I, the second one was Rush. That's the first oh, one I actually paid for. Yeah. Very good. I've been yeah. listening to some the Rush Hold lately. Your Fire tour. Yeah. 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 Oh, cool. Good for you. I've mentioned this before on the show. I don't know if I told you about this, but I'll throw it out there. The first concert I went to, it, it was something that my parents were going to. So I was mm -hmm. kind of along for the ride. And I didn't realize how important this concert was at the time. It, they, they loved 50s music, Sha Na Na. So we went to go see Sha Na Na. Okay, that's awesome, right? Yeah. Opening act, Andy Kaufman. <gasps> doing his Elvis impersonation. And I still have two of the programs. I have two copies. <gasps> yeah, yeah. I mean, and I was just like along for the you ride. You gotta one-up every story I tell. No, no! Really? <laughs> I, I, was, I was just there. That wasn't the one I, I chose yeah. to go. The one I chose to go to, oh God, the first one. Jeez, probably back in college, I went to go see The Monkees. Oh, cool. And, and the opening act was very important. Weird Al Yankovic. I mean, come on. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That was crazy. That so was... you have a history of seeing the greatest opening acts. <laughs> yeah, the... apparently so. <laughs> <laughs> Not that the monkeys are bad. I, I would I would pay to see the monkeys. I, oh, That's absolutely. a good choice. I've, they're, they're, people always make fun of that, but I love the monkeys. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I have all, ever since I was a kid, they were on TV, I would get out my cassette recorder. Well, that's why and people I would don't take, take the them show. seriously because it, because of the TV show. No, no, like, I, I know. know. Yeah. TV show is kind of tough to watch. I mean, it doesn't yeah. really, you know, but I mean, the music. Yeah. And they could really play music. They weren't, I mean, initially, yes, there were studio musicians, but Michael Nesmith could play. Michael Nesmith could play, yeah. And uh, Mickey Dolan could Mickey, play. He yeah. played guitar, actually, but he said, no, we need a drummer. You're going to be the drummer. So he yeah. learned, and I give him so much credit for this, he learned how to play drums. Became a drummer, like, overnight, yeah. And yeah. I mean, I don't care if he wasn't great or perfect. The guy learned how to play drums just to and it's do... And it's not like a guitar player, like, we don't need a guitar player to learn bass. That's, yeah. that's oh, no big deal. Okay. That happens yeah. all the time. Yeah, you can do that. Drums is a whole different thing. To you know? Totally, yeah. totally. And, and Peter, yeah. like, could play the piano. Yeah. He could play... Brass instruments. I mean, he was very, very talented. And the other guy was British. Yeah. So, <laughs> so but he, you know. but, but he was in Oliver. He was an actor, yeah. and he could sing. Yeah. So, and 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 if and, I could fly, and, the wings. And the gals loved him. So yeah. you needed well, to have that. <laughs> he was yeah. He was the Beatle. He was the he Beatle. Was the Beatle. Yeah. Final question. Not to not to make it a, a downer, but is there any regrets that you have? And you're still a young guy. You've got a, a lot ahead of you. So you don't have to, you know. You, you think I'm a young guy. That's wow. Well, that's it's, funny. It's all relative. I turned 49 in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, hey, you're not getting your AARP card yet. You're still a young guy. <laughs> Any regrets? And it doesn't be anything terrible. Just something like, oh, man, I wish I'd done this or that. And we can't change what we've done. It's I mean, funny. I, are, I, you know? I think about this a lot. I think about all the stupid shit I did when I was young. I think about... Um, I feel like I was like kind of thrown into the world and I was unprepared and I did a lot of stupid things. I spent the 90s half the time on hard drugs. I mean, uh, but I don't have regrets because I, I think about like if I had a time machine and I could go back and change that, um, then what would I become? Yeah, where would you be? What, yeah, yeah, like I learned really important lessons. And, you know, I, I, I love the baseball metaphor. I talk to people about this all the time. I, I think life is like baseball. Uh, if you hit the ball 30% of the time, you're considered great, you know, and that's what life is. 
Um, so I look at my failures as something that uh, kind of informed who I am. If I had done everything right, I might have a really boring job right now. I might not be a That's comic true. artist. I might have listened to the advice that people say. I might, if I did everything right, I would have went to college right after high school. I would have made bad decisions. And I might, I might be filthy rich, but would I would be, be miserable. That's yeah, right. Yeah, so I, I don't have regrets because I don't... Um, I like where I am. I like who I am. And uh, I wouldn't want to ever change that. All those experiences yeah. make us what we are today. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. If I changed anything, I'd be on a different path. And would I be happy? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the thing is, though, you came out okay. Yeah. You're doing well. Yeah. Well, your mistakes, yeah, your mistakes make you who you are. They're just as important as your successes. Maybe even more so. They made you stronger. Because yeah. if they didn't, you wouldn't be here right now. Yeah. yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. so you've got Mirror Smoke coming up. There's a success right there. Oh, please, mention your podcast. Go track yourself. Oh, jeez. I'm going to tell people that all night. Go track yourself. What? I'm a little embarrassed. Please don't listen. Don't listen to it. It's family no. friendly. No, it's not. No, um, <laughs> it's no, very no, no. stream of consciousness. If you ever want to hear a drunk guy from California having and a drunk fun. guy from New York talk having about fun. Star Trek, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, yeah, it's it's great. It's called Go Trek Yourself, and the, and the the reason we do it is because I don't get to hang out with Daryl enough, and we became best friends when we were living in New York, and and we just you know it's an excuse for us. To talk about what we love, which is Star Trek, and um, and I, I, I hope it comes across when you listen to it how much we love the material. Yes. But we're also really goofy, and we have uh, we have some good times, and we we use naughty words sometimes. And uh, well, here's it, the thing: you both love the show, so this is not something for people that well, what's Star Trek? I'm Star Trek about? No, no, no. This is like if you understand it, you know about it. Have some fun with it, and this is truly two guys. Who are great friends who have a good time so that's what it's all about they're having a good time exactly. talking about their favorite television series so that's what it's all about so if you want to have a good time along with them give it a listen yeah. and i hope hopefully there'll be more because i've been very very busy and i guess you're gonna be busy again now with this yeah we used to do it weekly and now we do it's it like hard. every yeah like we, we'll have like two yeah. one month and then go two months and have one but we're going to go back to the weekly when the Picard show comes on because yes. how are we not going to talk about how that? How can you not? Yeah, we're going, to, we're going to talk about it anyways. We might as well hit the record button and make a podcast. Are you, you trying know? to do one about the con right now? Were no, you planning? it hadn't occurred to me. <laughs> no, I, I, I thought you said that on one of your podcasts, and I thought, that's a lot of work. And if, if you're not, good. Because it's a lot of work. You yeah. got a lot to do here, and this this will this will take care of it. This yeah, I'm, I'm I'm too we, busy here. Got to cover. No, we, we, we did one before the con. We, we oh, yes, yes, just you did. Uh, before, yeah, just talking about it. Yeah, yeah, we came out of retirement for a minute, and, right. and when we get back, I'm going to do one with him and talk That's a little bit about it. But nothing one, while I'm here. I no, mean, it uh, is yeah. so hard yeah. to do. I mean, I've tried. It's crazy. I mean, busy. You have you have to find a hotel room. Yeah. And, and and have a couple of drinks and sit down and just like, chit chat. So it's not hearing like loudspeakers. Here we are. Here and here we are. But I appreciate the time you've taken. Well, thank spend. you. I, 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 enjoy, I enjoy your podcast. We I always have that. a good time. Yeah. We, we have so well, much you, in common. You, you break out the Bowie and stuff. We talk about rock and roll for a while. It's, it's nice. We, not everybody does that. You know? No, no. Well, it's, it's, it's about things that you love. Mm -hmm. And hopefully it's things that myself and other listeners love. And that's what we're here is to, to bring the love. Right. Yeah. JK, thanks so much. And enjoy thank the you. rest of the con. And Looking forward to the book coming up in October for Halloween. <laughs> what a treat. Cheers. For a video of that interview, please check out my YouTube channel, Creator Talks. It's also posted on Twitter under at Creator Talks Pod. For the video, I add some illustrations of JKs and other images that relate to the stories that we're talking about. I want to thank George from Meanwhile at the Podcast for suggesting this interview. Please check out his with JK. I had a great time. I plan to go back next year and experience the convention. My guest next show will be John Ward on his comic book, Scratcher. Please join us.